Hey there, welcome back to Story Slices, where we slice through the best Reddit tales just for you. Let's dive right into the first story. The first one is the title story, and it starts like this. Living in Sunnyside Estates seemed like a dream come true when my wife Sarah and I first moved in. The neighborhood was pristine, with manicured lawns and friendly neighbors. We'd saved for years to afford a home with a pool, and this place ticked all the boxes. Little did we know that our slice of paradise would soon become a battleground with the homeowners association. It all started last summer when we decided to install a fence around our new pool. Safety was our top priority, especially with our young kids and the neighbor's children often playing in the area. We wanted something sturdy and tall enough to prevent any accidents. Hey Mike, I called out to our next door neighbor one Saturday morning as I was sketching out plans in the backyard. We're thinking of putting up a fence around the pool. Any thoughts? Mike wandered over, coffee mug in hand. Sounds like a good idea Tom, those kids of yours are getting more adventurous by the day. How high are you thinking? We're looking at a six-foot privacy fence, I replied. Figure it'll keep the kids safe and give us a bit of privacy when we're swimming. Mike nodded approvingly. Smart move. Just make sure you run it by the homeowners association first. You know how Karen gets about this stuff. Karen was our homeowners association president, and her reputation for being a stickler for rules preceded her. I appreciated Mike's advice, but I wasn't too worried. After all, this was about safety, and surely the homeowners association would understand that. The next day, I submitted our fence plans to the Homeowners Association Board. I included detailed drawings, specifications, and even some safety statistics about pool fencing. I thought I had all my bases covered. A week later, I received an email from Karen. My heart sank as I read it. Dear Mr. Johnson, We have reviewed your application for a pool fence and regret to inform you that it has been denied. The proposed height of 6 feet exceeds our community guidelines which state that fences should not exceed 4 feet in height. Additionally, the solid privacy design obstructs views and could impede emergency access. Please revise your plans and resubmit for approval. Regards, Karen Smith, Homeowners Association President. I was floored. How could they prioritize aesthetics over safety? I immediately called Sarah to share the news. Can you believe this? I fumed. They want us to build a fence that any kid could easily climb over. Sarah sighed. That's ridiculous. What are we going to do? I'm going to fight this, I declared. We're not compromising on our children's safety. The next few weeks were a flurry of activity. I researched local pool safety laws, spoke with a contractor friend about building codes, and even reached out to a lawyer for advice. Armed with this information, I requested a meeting with the Homeowners Association Board. The meeting was set for a Tuesday evening at the community center. As I walked in, I could feel the tension in the room. Karen sat at the head of the table, flanked by other board members. I took a deep breath and began my presentation. Good evening everyone. I'm here to discuss the denial of our pool fence application I started. I understand your concerns about aesthetics and emergency access, but I believe safety should be our top priority. I went on to present the local laws regarding pool enclosures, which recommended a minimum height of 5 feet. I showed examples of other neighborhoods with similar fencing, and explained how a taller fence would actually enhance privacy for all neighbors. As I spoke, I could see some board members nodding in agreement, but Karen remained stone-faced. When I finished, Karen cleared her throat. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Johnson. While we appreciate your concerns, our guidelines are in place for a reason. We need to maintain a consistent look throughout the community and ensure that our maintenance team has easy access to all areas. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Are you saying that the Homeowners Association's right to access my backyard is more important than my children's safety? Karen's eyes narrowed. Mr. Johnson, I'd advise you to watch your tone. We're simply enforcing the rules that everyone agreed to when they moved here. The meeting ended in a stalemate. As I drove home, my frustration turned to determination. I wasn't going to let this go. The safety of my family was at stake. Over the next few days, I rallied support from other neighbors. Many were surprised to learn about the Homeowners Association's stance and agreed that safety should come first. We started a petition and gathered signatures from nearly every household in the community. But Karen and a few other board members wouldn't budge. They sent out a community-wide email reiterating their position and warning of consequences for those who violated the guidelines. That's when things took an unexpected turn. One morning, I woke up to find a certified letter in our mailbox. My hands shook as I opened it. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, This letter serves as formal notice that the Sunnyside Estates Homeowners Association is filing a lawsuit against you for your continued refusal to comply with community guidelines regarding fence height and design. We seek an injunction to prevent the construction of your proposed fence and damages for the cost of enforcing our rules. You have 30 days to respond to this summons. We strongly advise you to reconsider your position and comply with the Homeowners Association regulations to avoid further legal action. Sincerely, Karen Smith, Homeowners Association President. I couldn't believe it. They were actually suing us over a fence we hadn't even built yet. The audacity of it all made my blood boil. I immediately called Sarah, who was equally shocked. They can't do this, can they? She asked, her voice trembling. 
I don't know, I admitted, but we're not backing down. We need to talk to a lawyer. That afternoon, we met with Alice Hernandez, a local attorney who specialized in property disputes. As we explained our situation, her expression grew increasingly concerned. I've seen cases like this before, Alice said, leaning back in her chair. Homeowners associations can wield a lot of power, but they're not above the law. From what you've told me, I think we have a strong case. So what do we do now? Sarah asked. Alice smiled reassuringly. First, we're going to file a countersuit. We'll argue that the homeowners association is acting in bad faith and that their guidelines conflict with local safety laws. We'll also seek damages for the stress and inconvenience they've caused you. Over the next few weeks, our lives revolved around this lawsuit. We gathered evidence, collected testimonies from neighbors, and even brought in experts to testify about pool safety. The stress was enormous, but we knew we had to stand our ground. As the court date approached, the community was abuzz with talk about the case. Some neighbors openly supported us, while others sided with the homeowners association, worried about property values and the precedent this might set. Finally, the day of the trial arrived. As we walked into the courthouse, I felt a mix of nervousness and determination. This was it, the moment we'd been preparing for. The courtroom was packed with curious neighbors and local reporters. Karen and the homeowners association's lawyer sat on one side, looking confident. We took our seats next to Alice, who gave us a reassuring nod. The judge, a stern-looking woman in her 60s, called the court to order. We're here today to hear the case of Sunnyside Estates Homeowners Association v. Johnson, she announced. Let's begin with opening statements. The homeowners association's lawyer went first, painting us as troublemakers who were selfishly putting our desires above the good of the community. He argued that allowing our fence would open the floodgates to all sorts of violations of homeowners association rules. When it was Alice's turn, she calmly dismantled their arguments one by one. She presented the local safety laws, showed photos of similar fences in other communities, and argued that the homeowners association was overstepping its authority. Your Honor, Alice concluded, this case is about more than just a fence. It's about the right of homeowners to protect their families without unreasonable interference. The Johnsons have acted in good faith throughout this process, while the Homeowners Association has resorted to bullying tactics and frivolous lawsuits. As the trial progressed, witnesses were called. Our neighbors testified about the importance of pool safety, and experts explained the risks associated with inadequate fencing. The Homeowners Association brought in a real estate agent who claimed that taller fences could decrease property values, but under cross-examination, he admitted that safety features could actually increase a home's worth. The turning point came when Karen took the stand. Alice's questioning was relentless, exposing the inconsistencies in the homeowners association's policies and the arbitrary nature of their decision-making. Mrs. Smith, Alice asked, can you explain why the homeowners association believes it needs constant access to the Johnson's backyard? Karen squirmed in her seat. Well, we need to be able to inspect the property and ensure compliance with our rules. And how often do these inspections occur? As needed, Karen replied vaguely. So, Alice pressed, you're saying that the homeowners association's occasional need to peek into someone's backyard outweighs the daily safety concerns of a family with young children? Karen's face reddened. That's not, I mean, we have to consider the whole community. As Karen stumbled through her responses, I could see the judge's expression change. She was seeing through the homeowners association's flimsy arguments. After three grueling days of testimony, it was time for closing arguments. Both lawyers made impassioned pleas, but I felt that Alice had presented the stronger case. Finally, the judge cleared her throat. Having heard all the evidence and arguments presented, I'm prepared to render my decision. The courtroom fell silent. I grabbed Sarah's hand, both of us holding our breath. In the case of Sunnyside Estates Homeowners Association v. Johnson, I find in favor of the defendants, the judge announced. The Homeowners Association's attempt to prevent the Johnsons from installing a safety fence is not only unreasonable, but potentially negligent. Their claim of needing constant access to private property is overreaching and unsupported by any legitimate need. I could hardly believe my ears. We'd won? The judge continued. Furthermore, I find that the Homeowners Association acted in bad faith by filing this lawsuit. They are hereby ordered to pay all of the Johnsons' legal fees and to issue a formal apology to the community. The Homeowners Association is also instructed to revise its guidelines to comply with local safety laws within 30 days. The courtroom erupted in murmurs. I turned to Sarah, tears in my eyes, and we embraced. Alice beamed at us giving a thumbs up. As we left the courthouse, reporters swarmed around us. Mr. Johnson, how do you feel about the verdict? One of them asked, shoving a microphone in my face. I took a deep breath. We're relieved and grateful that the court recognized our right to protect our family. This was never about defying rules. It was about standing up for what's right. We hope this decision will help other homeowners who find themselves in similar situations. The aftermath of the trial was a whirlwind. Our story made local news, and we received messages of support from people all over the country who had dealt with overbearing homeowners associations. Some even asked for advice on how to handle their own disputes.
A week after the trial, we received a formal apology from the Homeowners Association, along with a check covering our legal expenses. Karen resigned from her position as president, and a special election was held to appoint new board members. The new Homeowners Association board worked quickly to revise the community guidelines. They not only allowed for taller pool fences, but also implemented a more transparent and collaborative approach to decision-making. It felt like a fresh start for the whole neighborhood. As for us, we finally got to install our pool fence. It stood six feet tall, a symbol of our perseverance and the power of standing up for what's right. The day it was completed, we hosted a pool party for the entire neighborhood. As I watched kids playing safely in our backyard and neighbors chatting happily, I felt a sense of pride. This fence represented more than just a barrier around our pool. It was a testament to the importance of community, safety, and standing up for what you believe in. Sarah sidled up to me, handing me a cold drink. Penny for your thoughts? She asked. I smiled, putting my arm around her, just thinking about how sometimes you have to fight for your little piece of paradise. She laughed. Well, I'd say it was worth it. Look at how happy everyone is. And she was right. Our battle with the Homeowners Association had been stressful and challenging, but it had brought our community closer together. We had turned a negative situation into an opportunity for positive change. As the sun began to set on our little victory celebration, I couldn't help but feel optimistic about the future. We had faced a seemingly insurmountable challenge and come out stronger on the other side. It was a reminder that with determination, support, and a little bit of luck, ordinary people can stand up to injustice and make a difference. The lawsuit over our pool fence had started as a simple dispute about safety and rules, but it had turned into something much bigger. It had become a story about the power of community, the importance of standing up for what's right, and the ability of individuals to affect change. As I looked around at our neighbors enjoying themselves, I realized that our fence now stood for something more than just safety. It was a symbol of our community's strength and resilience. And that, I thought, was the most valuable protection of all. Update. It's been about a year since our big showdown with the HOA, and I've got to say, life in Sunnyside Estates has taken quite a turn. Remember that pool party we threw after installing our fence? Well, it kind of set the tone for the whole neighborhood moving forward. After Karen's resignation and the election of the new board, things started changing pretty quickly. The new president, Dave, was a retired teacher who'd always been vocal about making the community more family-friendly. Under his leadership, the HOA became more of a support system than a policing force. One day, Dave knocked on our door. Hey Tom, got a minute? He asked. Sure, come on in, I replied, curious about what he wanted. We sat down in the living room and Dave got straight to the point. Look, I know you guys had a rough time with the old board, but I was hoping you might consider joining us. We could use someone with your experience and, well, guts. I was taken aback. Me? On the HO board? After everything that happened? But as Dave explained his vision for the community, I found myself getting interested. We want to focus on bringing people together, not driving them apart, he said. Your fence case showed us that we need to listen to residents and prioritize their needs. What do you say? I told Dave I'd think about it and discuss it with Sarah. That night, over dinner, I brought it up. So, the new HO wants me to join the board, I said, trying to gauge Sarah's reaction. She nearly choked on her pasta. Are you serious? After everything we went through? I nodded. I know, I know. But hear me out. This could be our chance to make sure what happened to us doesn't happen to anyone else. Plus, Dave seems genuinely committed to changing things. Sarah thought for a moment. You're right. If anyone knows how important it is to have reasonable people on the board, it's us. I think you should do it. So, I accepted the position. And let me tell you, it's been an eye-opening experience. We've been working hard to rebuild trust in the community. We revised the guidelines to be more flexible and family-oriented, started a community garden, and even organized a neighborhood watch program. But it hasn't all been smooth sailing. About six months into my term, we faced our first big challenge. A group of long-time residents, including some former board members, weren't happy with the changes. They claimed we were lowering standards and inviting chaos. It came to a head at our quarterly meeting. The room was packed, and you could cut the tension with a knife. One of the old guard, a guy named Frank, stood up to speak. This new board is running our property values into the ground, he declared. First, we let people build whatever fences they want. What's next? Pink houses and cars on the lawn? I took a deep breath and stood up. Frank, I understand your concerns, but let's look at the facts. Since we've implemented these changes, we've had five new families move in. Home sales are up 15% compared to last year, and complaints to the board are down by half. Frank sputtered. But, but what about our image? This used to be an exclusive community. I looked him straight in the eye. Exclusive doesn't have to mean exclusionary. We're building a community where people want to live, not just a place that looks good on paper. The room erupted in applause. It was clear that most residents preferred our new approach. After the meeting, several people came up to thank us for the changes. But we weren't out of the woods yet. A few weeks later, we received notice that Frank and a few others were suing the HO, claiming we had overstepped our authority in changing the guidelines. Here we go again, I thought, but this time, we were prepared. 
We called an emergency community meeting to discuss the lawsuit. The turnout was incredible. Almost every household was represented. Folks, I began, were facing a legal challenge from some residents who disagree with our new policies. We wanted to be transparent about this and get your input on how to proceed. The room buzzed with conversation. Then, Mike, my neighbor who had warned me about Karen way back when, stood up. I've lived here for 20 years, he said, and I've never seen this place so lively and welcoming. If these people want to sue, let them. But they don't speak for me, or I bet most of us here. A chorus of agreement followed. Person after person stood up to voice their support for the new HOA policies. By the end of the meeting, we had a clear mandate from the community to fight the lawsuit. We hired Alice, the same lawyer who had helped us with our fence case. She was thrilled to be working on the right side of an HOA dispute for once. This case is even clearer cut than yours was, she told us during our first meeting. The HOA board has broad discretion to amend guidelines, especially when it's done with community input and support. These plaintiffs don't have a leg to stand on. The case moved quickly. The judge, recognizing the frivolous nature of the lawsuit, agreed to an expedited hearing. In the courtroom, Alice systematically dismantled the plaintiff's arguments, presenting evidence of increased property values, improved community satisfaction, and the overwhelming support of residents. In the end, the judge not only ruled in our favor, but also ordered the plaintiffs to pay the HOA's legal fees. It was a resounding victory for our vision of what an HOA could be. After the trial, Frank approached me in the courthouse hallway. I braced myself for another confrontation, but to my surprise, he extended his hand. I guess I was wrong, he said gruffly. You've done good by the community. I'm sorry for all this trouble. I shook his hand, feeling a weight lift off my shoulders. Thanks, Frank. There's still room for your input in how we run things. Why don't you come to the next meeting and share your ideas? He nodded, a small smile breaking through his usual scowl. As news of our victory spread, we started getting calls from other communities facing similar issues. People wanted to know how we had transformed our HOA from a source of conflict to a force for community building. Sarah suggested we put together a guide to share our experiences. We worked on it together, detailing the steps we took to change the HOA culture, handle disputes, and foster a sense of community. We called it Building Bridges, Not Fences, a guide to creating a positive HO. When we shared it online, it went viral in homeowner circles. Soon, we were getting invitations to speak at community meetings and real estate conferences. It was amazing to see how our little fence dispute had snowballed into a movement for positive change in communities across the country. Sarah and I often marveled at how differently things had turned out from what we'd initially expected. Remember when we thought the fence would just keep the kids safe? Sarah said one evening as we sat on our patio, watching the sunset over the neighborhood. I chuckled. Yeah, who knew it would end up protecting a whole lot more than that? As I looked out at our community, kids playing in yards, neighbors chatting over fences, people walking dogs and waving hello, I felt a deep sense of satisfaction. Our stand against an unfair system had led to real, lasting change. The fence that started it all still stood strong, a reminder of the power of standing up for what's right. But now, instead of dividing us, it had become a symbol of our community's strength and unity. We had turned a negative experience into an opportunity for growth, not just for ourselves, but for our entire community. And in doing so, we'd found something I never expected when we first moved to Sunnyside Estates, a true sense of home. Are you hungry for more slices of stories? Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to never miss out on any videos. See you tomorrow at Story Slices.